Well, good morning, New Day. <laughs> so good to see you guys. Thanks so much for coming out. A big thank you to everyone who's tuned in online. However you're joining us, I'm just so glad that you're here. Hey, right before we get going, a huge happy Father's Day to all the dads in the house. Um, I hope you win that steak. I hope you win those meat sticks. They're delicious. I can vouch for that, okay? They're absolutely awesome. So anyway, happy Father's Day to everybody. Um, for those of you, thank you. For those of you who are new, um, right now as a church, we are studying through the gospel of Matthew. And what we've been doing is just taking it one little section at a time. And that has brought us to the section we're covering today, which is Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 to 12, where Jesus issues this warning to his original disciples as well as to you and I today. Beware of the leaven. Beware of the leaven. Now, the entire sermon today is based off the word picture of leaven. And if all of us just made all of our own homemade bread every day and didn't buy it at the store, we wouldn't need any explanation. But since most of us don't, uh, this does require an explanation. So let's begin there. Leaven is simply an, an agent that's used in baking that causes bread to rise. And there's a number of different agents that you can use to make bread rise. But the one that Jesus is referring to uh, in our text today uh, is specifically the agent called yeast. Now, for me, when I make homemade sourdough bread or I make bagels on the weekends for my kids, or I make pretzels like I did yesterday with my daughter that all the family ate. These recipes call for yeast. Okay, you can make the dough, and that's simple enough. You take flour, you take water, you take salt, you mix them together, voila, there you go, you have dough. But if you just go ahead and take that dough without adding yeast to it and you stick it in the oven, uh, number one, it's not going to taste very good. And number two, it's probably going to be pretty flat because the yeast is what helps cause everything to rise. Now, this might be a little more than you need, but I want you to understand today so you get what Jesus is saying. So here's the deal. Yeast is a microscopic fungus. It's this living thing and it needs to eat. So when you add it into your dough, it takes the starches from the flour and it breaks them down, converting them to sugar, and then it eats the sugar as a meal so that it can like, you know, be alive and have energy. Well, just like you and I, after we eat, after yeast eats, there's a waste product. No, it sounds gross, but that's how it works. And the waste product of yeast is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is what causes all those bubbles. So after I make a, a fresh loaf of sourdough bread, uh, take, take a look. When you slice it right down the middle, you see all those little pockets of air, all those air holes. It's called crumb structure. Well, long story short, the carbon dioxide was trying to escape out, but it couldn't go out. So instead, it went up and it causes those bubbles and causes the bread to rise and also causes everything to taste delicious. So here is the deal. Here's why I mentioned all that information. Simply put, what that teaches us about yeast is this. Yeast influences the dough. Yeast influences the dough. And now that you know the nature of yeast, that it influences, now we're ready to dive into our text. We see five things in the passage we're studying today. Uh, the dilemma, the directive, the discussion, the disapproval, and the discernment. And we're going to take these one at a time, beginning with, number one, the dilemma. The dilemma. If you take a look at the map... What you're going to see is that Jesus and his disciples uh, had been on the western side of the Sea of Galilee in Magadan. When Jesus got into it once again with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, something that's happening uh, more and more frequently as Jesus is now only six months away from his crucifixion on the cross. 
Now, these religious leaders had come to Jesus there on the western side of the Sea of Galilee in order to test him. But guess what Jesus did? He flipped the script. He turned the tables on them, and he went ahead and tested the religious leaders. And guess what they did? They failed the test. They failed it miserably, and they failed it publicly. And this, of course, only served to further fuel the religious leaders' hatred of Jesus to the point that Jesus now feels the need, again, take a look at the map, to go ahead and travel away from Magadan to Bethsaida, which was located uh, seven miles away from Magadan. So everybody, did you hear me? They rode seven miles I remember not too long ago, I was looking to do some kayaking with some friends in southern Vermont, and all of us being past the age of 40 showed up, saw how big the lake was, felt that the wind was blowing against us. We said, how long is it to the other side? And they said, oh, it's about a mile and a half down. I'm like, does a bus pick us up when we get to the other side? No, 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 you have to row back. And I was like, are you kidding me? I got a rope there and back, and I'm paying you to do this? Well, guess what me and my friends did? We opted for the jet skis. Can I get a hallelujah? We opted for the jet skis. There's some things you don't want to do when you get past the age of 40, and that was one. I don't want to row for fun and pay people to do it. That's insane. Okay, anyway. Anyway. They did not have the option to rent the jet ski, so they had to row seven miles from Magadan to Bethsaida. So naturally, by the time they arrived on the shores of Bethsaida, they were tired and hungry. And it was right at this time when their stomachs were growling, reminding them that they were due to eat, that they realized that they had forgotten to bring any bread. Now, Mark's gospel informs us that they had one loaf of bread to split between the 13 of them, the 12 disciples plus Jesus. And this was a real problem because of where they are. Remember, geographically, they're on the outskirts of Bethsaida. This was the same location where Jesus miraculously fed a crowd of some 25,000 people. And and do you remember what we learned about Bethsaida when we were in that passage? We learned that it was a desolate place. That's why when Jesus was ministering to the crowds there, as it came towards the end of the day, the disciples urged Jesus to dismiss the crowds that they might go find food in one of the nearby villages because there on the outskirts of Bethsaida, there was nowhere to buy food. So friends, do you see number one, the dilemma? They were in the middle of nowhere, They had one loaf of bread, and all 13 of them are starving to death from rowing seven miles across the lake. So that is the dilemma. The second thing we see in our text, we'll call this the directive. The directive. After having crossed the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is physically in Bethsaida. But you know where he is in his mind? He's back in Magadan where he's just had this huge confrontation with the religious leaders of Israel, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The disciples, of course, are only thinking about dinner, but Jesus is thinking about danger, the danger that the religious leaders of Israel uh, posed for his disciples and to anyone seeking to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus, not having his mind on dinner, Jesus having his mind on danger, turns to his disciples and he issues this directive. He says, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And friends, let's see who is paying attention. In one word, what does yeast represent? Yeast represents... Influence. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's start over. (laughs) Yeast represents influence. And now that we know what yeast represents, 
we can interpret what Jesus was telling his disciples. When he says, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's saying, look out for the corrupting and damning influence of the religious leaders of Israel. He's saying, just as yeast influences dough, if you're not careful, the Pharisees and the Sadducees will influence you. So watch and beware. That's the directive. Now that you've seen the directive, let's note the third thing we see in our text, which we'll call the discussion. The discussion. Unlike Jesus, who's only thinking about the corrupting influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the disciples are thinking about food. So when Jesus interrupts their conversation about bread and mentions the word leaven, they began discussing it among themselves, saying, oh boy, we're in trouble now because we brought no bread. We didn't bring enough bread for dinner. And Jesus just cannot believe how spiritually dull and undiscerning his disciples are. He's like, God, you, we've been together now for two and a half years. I'm going to be dead in six months. You guys still don't even yet understand the absolute basics. Uh, how are you not perceiving what I'm talking to you about? And because they were so spiritually dull and undiscerning, this is why we see the fourth thing in our text, which is the disapproval. The disapproval. So here Jesus is, he's trying to teach his uh, disciples a, a lesson about the corrupting influence of the religious leaders of Israel, uh, but his disciples are just so spiritually undiscerning and spiritually dull that Jesus has to take a time out and just say, hey, we're going to get back to the lesson in just a minute, but can I do a little parenthetical uh, correcting before we get back to the lesson? They think that Jesus is upset about them not having bread. So there they are worrying about dinner. And because of this, Jesus now says to them, picking up in verse 8, O oh, you of little faith. So do you see the disapproval? O oh, you of little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, even though you've been with me now two and a half years? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered afterwards? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? So here's what's going on. Jesus is saying, why are you worrying about not having food for dinner? Friends, where they are is in Bethsaida. It's the exact same location where only a few months ago, there were 25,000 mouths to feed and only five loaves of bread. But for Jesus, that wasn't an issue. He miraculously multiplied the five loaves. He fed every single mouth. And to boot, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. Shortly after Jesus performed that miracle for the Jewish people, he relocated southeast to the Gentile region of the Decapolis, and in the Decapolis, there was another bread shortage. This time, there was roughly 20,000 mouths to feed, and there was seven loaves of bread. But once again, this wasn't a problem for Jesus. He miraculously multiplied the seven loaves to feed the some 20,000 people that had gathered to hear him teach and to experience him healing. And there were seven baskets of leftovers to boot. So Jesus, in effect, is arguing from the greater to the lesser. He's saying, if I can take five loaves of bread and feed 25,000 people, if I can take seven loaves and feed 20,000 people, how much more so can I take one loaf and multiply it to feed 13 people? So again, how can you think that my concern is that we're not going to have enough food for dinner? So you see, Jesus is expressing disapproval in his disciples for not having enough faith to trust him to provide. Well, 
Having made it abundantly clear that his concern was not dinner, rather danger, Jesus now returns to the lesson he's trying to teach his disciples before he dies. Once again, Jesus repeats the directive. He says nothing more, nothing less than exactly what he first said. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, what you would expect to see here is a bunch of explanation because Jesus said this statement and they were totally confused what Jesus meant by what he said. So what we expect to see here are a bunch of explanatory notes where Jesus is like, okay, and I know I said it before, but you weren't getting it. So let me just kind of, it's like this. Let me give you an illustration. Let me explain it deeper. He doesn't do any of that. And and it seems that what Jesus is doing is he's saying, guys, this is not the first time that I've taught about leaven. I need you to think. Guys, please use your brains. What has leaven always meant and represented in all the teaching that I've given you about leaven? Think about it. I'm not giving the explanatory notes. I'm not adding commentary. I'm not going to give you an illustration. Think about, you, you know the answer. So think about it. And friends, it was them thinking about the answer that leads to the fifth and final thing we see in our text, and we'll call this the discernment. The discernment. As Jesus basically challenged them to think about what leaven might mean, no doubt in my mind, they would have thought about the parable of the leaven that Jesus had shared not too long ago in what we know as Matthew chapter 13. In the parable of the leaven, Jesus taught that in the same way that leaven influences dough, so my kingdom will one day influence the world. So as they remembered that leaven represents influence, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they, they finally got it. They finally discerned what Jesus was saying and speaking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, how many of you understand that anything mentioned in the Bible, even once, is important for us to perk up and pay attention to, right? So how much more so... Is it important that we perk up and pay attention when something in the Bible is repeated over and over and over and over again? Friends, if we go back in Matthew's gospel, we will see that this is not the first time that Jesus has told his disciples to watch and beware of the religious leaders. Jesus, again, is six months away approximately from his crucifixion and not wanting his disciples to miss an incredibly important lesson, he repeats something that he said before. So that should make you and I just really perk up. What is so important that Jesus would take the limited space he's gonna give us in scripture and mention something again? So friends, that's what we're gonna turn our attention to now. What was it about the religious leaders that was so bad that it warranted such a serious uh, watch and beware type warning? Well, number one, the religious leaders, they were heretical. They were heretical. The religious leaders taught the people the wrong way to be saved. They taught a righteousness a right standing before God that came as the result of strict adherence to the Mosaic law. But as the apostle Paul put it in Galatians chapter three, no one is justified before God by the law. And this is exactly why Jesus taught the people, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now don't be confused here. Jesus wasn't saying, if you can one-up the religious leaders, then you'll get into heaven. If you can only follow the Mosaic law even stricter than they do, then you'll earn your spot in heaven. No. He's saying the righteousness that they've created, that's not even in scripture. You need a different righteousness altogether because the one that they teach and preach doesn't even save. So friends, Jesus warns the disciples about the religious leaders, uh, number one, because they were heretical. They taught the wrong way to be saved. 
But not only were they heretical, number two, they were also hypocritical. The word hypocrite originally meant actor. And an actor is someone who puts on a show. And that's what the religious leaders of Israel were doing for the people. They were putting on a show. They would give to the poor. They would say their prayers uh, in public. They would go out in public when they were fasting. And they would pretend as if they were doing these various religious acts of devotion for God when, in matter of fact, they were doing it to impress the people. Friends, there's nothing wrong with doing an act of religious devotion for God that other people might happen to see. Nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with doing a religious act of devotion for people while pretending that you're doing it for God. If you do that, you are nothing more than a hypocrite, an actor, because you're doing nothing more than putting on a show. And this is exactly what the religious leaders of Israel were doing. They were putting on a show for people. So number one, they were heretical. Number two, they were hypocritical. Now, number three, they were heartless. They were heartless. The religious leaders had no compassion for people. And we saw this so clearly when we were back in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew 12, the disciples are picking some grain in a field on the Sabbath day, something the law of Moses allowed, but something that the religious leaders' tradition did not. But did the religious leaders of Israel care about the disciples' hunger? Did they care about the disciples' physical needs? Absolutely not. And Jesus just said, guys, you're so heartless. Later on in that same passage, there was a man with a withered hand that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, something the Mosaic law allowed Jesus to do, but something the traditions of the religious leaders did not. So they were upset that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. They didn't care about the man with the withered hand. They didn't care about his suffering. They didn't care about his plight. They just cared about their rituals and their rules. And so Jesus tells them this in verse 7 of chapter 12. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy here is compassion that wells up within us, that moves us to act on behalf of the person who is suffering or in need. Jesus' indictment against the religious leaders was that they actually cared more about their animals than they did people. Because if one of their sheep or donkeys fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, they wouldn't hesitate to reach down and pull it up, giving the animal the help that it needed, but they didn't share this same level of compassion and care and concern for people. So do you see? They weren't just heretical. They weren't just hypocritical. Thirdly, they were heartless. And now fourthly and finally, they were also hollow. They were also hollow, meaning they lacked what Jesus was looking for on the inside. The Bible teaches that true religion is a religion that springs from the heart. But the only religion the religious leaders had were, was a religion that was all external. Jesus said, oh, I don't only care that you don't murder people, I also care whether or not you have hatred in your heart. You see, it's a heart issue. Because it's hatred in the heart that leads to murder. Jesus says, it's not enough that you don't commit the external act of adultery. I also need you to not lust in your heart because it's lust in your heart that leads to the adultery. And true religion is religion of the heart. He says, I want you to give to the poor to help those in need. I want you to pray. I want you to fast. But do you know that doing these external acts is not enough? They have to emanate from the right motivation in the heart, if they're to be acts that are pleasing in God's sight. But everything they did was external, not internal. And that's why Jesus told his countrymen in Matthew chapter 15, verse eight, that God had this complaint against them. This people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So Jesus was saying, simply put, on the inside, your hollow. On the inside, you have nothing that God the Father is looking for. So friends, now do you understand why Jesus issued the grave warning that he issued? Watch and beware. 
He didn't want his disciples teaching heresy. He didn't want his disciples practicing hypocrisy. He didn't want his disciples being heartless, having no compassion for people, nor did he want his disciples to practice a religion that was nothing more than a list of external rules and regulations. So he appropriately warns his disciples to watch and beware. Now, friends, though this text was originally written to disciples of Jesus living in the first century, how many of you understand that? Though it was written to them, it was ultimately written for believers of every day and every age and every culture. So what that means, simply put, is that Jesus' message to them is Jesus' message to us. Jesus is saying to us today, watch and beware of corrupting influences. Just because we don't have Pharisees and Sadducees walking around today in our day and age in our culture doesn't mean that we don't have our own corrupting influences to watch out for and to beware of. We absolutely do. Now, now to corrupt is to destroy integrity. To, de, to, to, de, uh, to corrupt is to lower morality. So we simply need to ask ourselves, what is having that effect on our lives today? And I'm going to give you some questions by way of application. Uh, what temptations has Satan laid in your path for the sole purpose of corrupting your faith? The bad news about temptation is that many temptations we have no control over. That's the bad news about temptation. But you know what the good news about temptation is? Many of the temptations that are in our lives, we have 100% control over. And when you have control over a certain temptation, Jesus says, watch out. Beware that you don't leave that temptation in your life. You can't prevent a bird from flying over your head. You can absolutely prevent it from building a nest in your hair. And so it is with temptation. All right, that's temptation. Uh, Let's talk about friendships. Let's talk about relationships. I remember as a teenager, I had to learn the lesson that bad company corrupts good character. I had a best friend, but he was going this way. And spiritually, I was going this way, two different directions. And I just realized he's having more of a negative influence on me than I'm having positive on him. It's time to make a break. You got any relationships like that? It's good you're trying to win them to the Lord, but if they're having a more negative influence on you than you're having positive on them, now it's your own soul that's at risk. Time to break the relationship up. Speaking of relationships that need to be broke up, Sometimes you have professing believers dating someone that is not a Christian. Nowadays, we call that missionary dating to give something that's forbidden a nice little title that makes it sound okay. But you know what the Bible calls it? Being unequally yoked. You know what the Bible calls it? Being a disobedient disciple of Jesus. Let's pretend that you're unsaved person Let's pretend you got a chair right here, okay? You got a chair. And you're standing on top of the chair. Is it easier for your unsaved person to pull you down? Or is it easier for you on the chair to lift them up? The obvious answer is that it's way easier for them to pull you down into sin than it is for you to pull them up to Christ. And that's why the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. Let's talk about entertainment. Social media is one of the big ways that we entertain ourselves today. And just to be clear, I'm not saying it's wrong in and of itself. However, with that said, if it's leading you into narcissism, pride, jealousy, or no longer being content with your clothes, your home, your lifestyle, or your spouse, you might need to take a big step back. Because don't think you can expose yourself to something without it having 
an influence on your life one way or the other. Watch out. Beware. Let's talk about television, movies, music. I'm not saying to abandon all of these things or any of these things. I am saying be discerning, lest these things serve to morally corrupt you and your faith and bring it down. Remember, to corrupt is to bring someone down morally. To, de- to, to corrupt is to destroy integrity. When you come to church on a Sunday, what you hear is roughly 40 minutes of instruction where you learn God's morals and values and worldview. Statistically, though, most people are watching three to four hours of TV a day. So 40 minutes once a week at church, 240 minutes daily times seven. Not a great mathematician, that's a lot of minutes. And when we watch TV, if we're not discerning of what we're watching, we are spending three to four hours a day learning Satan's values, Satan's morals, Satan's worldview. It's going to have an influence on you. It's going to corrupt your faith. We have to watch out. Now, on this Father's Day, I'm reminded of the responsibility of parents to not only guard themselves from morally corrupting influences, but to diligently do the work of guarding their children as well. Dads, on the Father's Day, let me talk to you just for a second. We we take pride in our role as protector of the family. And we just like to almost fantasize of someone coming up at a park and doing something weird to our kid. And we're just like, we're going to come. Oh, I'm a man. You know, I'm the protector. And we're going to come in and, and we're going to. But how many of you understand that being the protector, the realm is not limited to the, to the physical. It includes the spiritual as well. Some of us who would so just, I mean, we would just go attack mode if there was any threat of danger to our children physically, but then spiritually. What are they doing on social media? What are they doing online? Who are their friends? Is their education for them being a source of moral corruption? We got to watch for these things. Because the list goes on and on and on of the various ways in which Satan is trying to trip up not just our children, but us as well. So what do we do? Jesus already shared the directive. We watch and we have to beware of the leaven. Friends, real quick, can meat spoil yes or no? This is not a trick question. Can milk spoil yes or no? I was here a couple Sundays ago and I was pouring myself a coffee. I learned that half and half can spoil for sure. I was upstairs in the office and it had been left in the fridge just a little too long. And that same thing can happen to our faith. It can become corrupted. It can spoil. So we have to watch and beware of the leaven. Today's passage is a warning of the gravest kind. And friends, when it comes to warnings, they can be heeded or they can be ignored. It's like this. Back in 2018, California experienced the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in its history, a fire that came to be known as Camp Fire that ironically primarily affected a beautiful town called Paradise. Look at all these beautiful pictures of the town, just a nice little uh, suburban place, a little rural, beautiful home, shops, all these things. Now, prior to the fire's outbreak, there were warnings and advisories issued by local authorities and the fire departments about the high fire risk in the region, as well as recommendations for residents to be prepared to evacuate if necessary. But unfortunately, despite the warnings, some residents chose not to evacuate and they underestimated the potential danger posed by the fire. As a result, as the fire raged on, they found themselves trapped and unable to escape as the flames rapidly spread. The fire moved quickly, fueled by dry conditions and strong winds, and it engulfed the town of Paradise within hours, and the consequences were devastating, with the fire claiming the lives of 85 people and destroying thousands of of homes and structures as you've just seen. 
And the tragedy of this event reminds us of one thing. It's so important not to ignore warnings, especially when they're given to us by God. Oh, Matthew wrote the passage, but it was God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired him to write. So when Matthew says, hey, it's about beware and warn, no, that's ultimately God, the Holy Spirit, saying, watch and beware of the leaven. It's God, the Son, telling us, watch and beware of the leaven. So we need to heed the warning. Church, I want to end today by praying for you, specifically a prayer of spiritual protection. Because that's what we need living in this crazy world that we live in with so many different sources of negative spiritual influence. So if you'll let me, I'd love to close our time together by praying for you. So if you want me to pray for you, just close, uh, close your eyes, bow your head, just get in a posture of prayer, leave them open if you want, whatever, just get in a posture of prayer. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this text, for this warning. Uh, it is our desire not to ignore it, rather to heed it. Help us, we pray. And Father, I pray for the people of New Day Church. We read in John 17 uh, of Jesus' prayer for his disciples. And he said, my prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them while they live in the world from the evil one. We read in 2 Thessalonians 3 that the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And Father, that's my prayer today for the people of New Day Church, that you would protect them from the evil one and from the morally corrupting influences in this world that Satan is ultimately behind. God, I pray, give the people of New Day Church eyes to see when a corrupting influence enters their lives and give them your heavenly perspective to see it for what it is, a dangerous fire that will take their life, spiritually speaking, if they don't heed the warning that Jesus issued today to beware of the leaven. Father, we pray for your help and we ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Right, give God some praise. Well, we just learned a very powerful lesson. Beware of the leaven. Beware of any corrupting influences in your life. Keep your faith pure. But for some of you here today, this might be your first time at New Day. This might be your first time at church in general. And if it is, I'm just so glad that you're here. Because before you go, I want to take a second and just share with you what our faith is in. And our faith is in Jesus. Our faith is in the fact that when we were guilty of sin, we're guilty of rebellion against God, God loved us so much that he didn't want us to have to pay the sin penalty, which is death. He loved us so much that instead, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, down to earth. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus died anyway. He didn't die for his own sin. He died for my sin, and he died for your sin as well. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we say, Jesus, forgive me, forgive my sins. Jesus, make me new. Save me from the penalty of sin, which is death. He will. All we have to do is put our faith in him. When we keep that faith pure, when we believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he died and rose again to forgive us for our sins, we no longer have to look forward to that sin penalty of death. Instead, we have eternal life in heaven. That's what God ultimately wants for us. That's what I have for myself because I've put my faith in Jesus. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet, it's my prayer that you'll do that today so that you can have the assurance of eternity in heaven as well. So if you want to make that decision today, that is the best decision you could ever make. And I want to make sure that you get a Bible before you leave. So to get that Bible, just let me know that you got saved by taking out your welcome card and checking off the box that says, I have decided to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. Bring that out to guest services in the foyer before you go. We'll celebrate with you. We'll give you your Bible there. And if you're online, I want to get you a Bible as well. We're going to mail that to you when you either use the QR code on your screen or when you use the link coming up in the chat right now. So if you just got saved today, congratulations. We're all so, so happy for you. All right, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much again for coming out. Happy Father's Day to all you dads, and God bless the rest of your Sunday. 
Thanks for experiencing this message with us. Do you want more New Day Church in your life? Well, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Want to take a next step in your faith? Our Church Center app is the best place to get more connected. So just download the free app on your app store today and be sure to choose New Day Church in Enfield, Connecticut. We are able to offer this sermon and all others like it only because of your faithful financial support. Thank you to all of you who so faithfully give each week. If you feel led to support our ministry financially, just go to our website at newdaychurch.cc forward slash give. Thank you in advance. May God richly bless you, and we hope to see you again real soon.